Okay. Too much, maybe for Switzerland today, but. <laughs> okay, I will start with the broadcast in one minute. So Francesco, just to, to uh, briefly tell you again, I have to leave a bit earlier at the end. I have another meeting. Yeah. So you had the Brazilian uh, Congress, I know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's why you are uh, the first to, to speak. Uh, yeah. and, uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. No My pleasure. Uh, and so after the... Uh, uh, Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Uh, I am Ala Al Banasuri. I am the chief of the cornea and refractive surgery at the Maghrabi Hospital in Jeddah, and uh, I have the pleasure and honor to moderate this symposium. Uh, and I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, CSO. Uh, especially the R&D department uh, in CSO for making this uh, gathering possible. Um, and uh, this is a great addition to the educational series that CSO have been doing uh, uh, for the last few months. And uh, this evening we have a group of wonderful uh, presenters. Uh, and uh, without any due delay, we're going to start with the first presentation. Uh, from uh, Dr. Emilio Torres Neto. Uh, Emilio uh, works at the University of Zurich. Uh, he is an accomplished uh, cornea, cataract, and refractive surgeon. Uh, Emilio has lots of publications focused mainly on uh, cornea, keratoconus, cross-linking, and biomechanical properties of the cornea. And uh, Emilio is going to uh, teach us uh, the OCT-based cornea topography as a new era in diagnostic. Uh, Emilio, please. Thank you, Allah, for the very kind introduction. Let me share my screen here. Uh, so can you see the screen right now? Yeah, wonderful picture. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank uh, CSO for organizing this very interesting webinar. Uh, it's such a pleasure to participate with this great team. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's go to our topic, OCT-based coronal tomography, a new era in the diagnostics. So uh, these images uh, here show our current equipment at Elsa Institute here in Zurich uh, to evaluate evaluate the anterior chamber. So we have a wide range of uh, uh, anterior segment tomography and uh, other devices as well. Uh, but uh, 
and although I don't have any commercial interest at all, I have to say that this new device, uh, which we've had since since last year, has really has really been a game changer uh, for us in some cases. So uh, this is a spectral domain OCT combined with placido disk topography. Uh, so we have here the two technologies uh, working together, and of course, this bring the biggest additive benefit of the OCT here. And uh, we all know for a long time, but here are some advantages of OCT technology. And I would say the main one would be the image quality. So uh, all, uh, when we see an OCT image, we can clearly see it is from an OCT. We can clearly define this. So the quality is something that brings us attention. Uh, but especially for cornea, the analysis of structures that normally are deeper in the cornea used to be uh, better seen or better measured with OCT. So we are also used to, to, uh, to, to check the pachymetry or the demarcation line in crosslinking, for example. We usually measure it with OCT. So uh, we can see deeper structures and uh, especially it is uh, less affected by the scattering, so opacities are less affected. And uh, finally, one uh, another, now not on this deep, deeper on the corner, but on the surface, would be the epithelial map. So this is a quite new additive tool uh, in refractive assessment, I would say. So uh, from now on, I will show here some cases in which we use it, OCT, and it was decisive. So instead of uh, speaking, I will, uh, I will show you some cases uh, we had. So this first case was uh, a patient with keratoglobus. So he had a very intense protrusion, as we, you can see here. Uh, and there is not only a diffuse finning, but also some opacities. And when we see the shine flug images, the, these were on the right, uh, on the left inferior inside, we can see how those opacities limit the ability to view the endothelial level or most, more posterior in the corner. And of course, uh, this limitation of shine flug also reflects the ability that we have to estimate pachymetry or the thickness of the corner. So you can see the, the, the thickness, corner thickness profile here uh, quite, uh, homogeneous from the half inferior of the corner. And we had que we question if this was really the case of our patient. Uh, but then on the other hand, here we can see already measurements with OCT uh, and Placido technology. And that was much closer to what we found clinically. So the left inferior image is shown now the corner thickness profile of this, uh, this corner. And basically this these better results and these better measurements would be possible or they are possible to do to an acquisition of images that have less noise than shine flu. Uh, and here you can see very well how we see the back surface very clearly here. And uh, of course, this information can be very important for many reasons, but in our case was important for surgical planning. So uh, advanced cases where uh, Dauk uh, also would be indicated. This image can help uh, to 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 program to plan the surgery. But here in this specific case, uh, we did a cross-linking with our SUP 400 protocol, and it was very useful to estimate the thickness pre-operatively correctly. And uh, here is the pre-operative progression. Uh, so before cross-linking, just to illustrate this case. Uh, and a stability more than two years after individualized crosslinking. So uh, this is not a subject, but just to show you how we use it, this technology in our favor to really see almost limbos to lim uh, limbo uh, to limbo, both sides with high resolution in a keratoglobus patient. Uh, a second case that uh, uh, that OCT provided us with a very interesting tool was regarding epithelial map. So uh, this is a case of map dot fingerprint dystrophy. You can see superior 
on the Placido disks there, there is, there are some irregularities. And if you notice the resolution, the image show a very well, uh, show very well the epithelial lesions. When we do it a bit closer, we can see even better. And uh, now this is another interesting tool that uh, MS39 bring us. Uh, it's what it call uh, an anamorphic images. So basically it makes the anterior surface uh, straight and we here uh, can see the corner in a way that we were not used uh, to, to see, but we can see, uh, of course, a very high resolution. If you note, uh, we can see even the Bowman layer. So the Bowman layer are those two layers just above the endothelial. So this can be very helpful for identifying, for example, patients uh, after PRK. So if you're not sure if the patient had or not PRK before, we, we could observe these two lines. So the presence of Bowman, of course, would uh, say that the patient did not have PRK. Uh, but here, uh, our patient, and again, we could see that the lesion of that patient were just at the endothelial. So this image brings us a new toy, let's say. And not just that, but also this is steep area that the, the patient had coincide, coincides or their corresponds exactly where the epithelial thickening area was. So in this case, specifically, uh, the epithelium was removed. This here was with alcohol. Uh, and then right after a PTK of 15 micra uh, was done. And here, just after, right after the surgery, you can see the epithelium was removed already. And we can see how the epithelial surface was improved. And this was reflected by uh, the sagittal anterior topography. And this was just after the procedure. Uh, but perhaps this is one of the most interesting cases we had, as we could observe, which actually change the treatment management because of the OCT technology. So a patient came with uh, mixed astigmatism for refractive surgery. Here you can see the preoperative tomography. So she, she or, or he, she had a mixed astigmatism. And that was ablation profile that was planned and performed. And the patient, the surgery had no, no, no issues. The cause of was unremarkable. But then a year later, uh, the patient returned and uh, she was complaining about uh, low visual acuity. And we could saw, we could see here in the periphery, uh, the haze. So this is an OCT image on the right corner. We can see the densitometry from a Shibfu device. And here again, uh, uh, the tool that MS39 provide us, we could see dotted in the, the yellow lines, the epithelium, and right above uh, in the peripheral area where the, the ablation was performed, we could see there the, the haze. And this was a year after PRK, so the, on the left, the anterior curvature and, uh, from Scheinflug, and on the right, the, the densitometry. So you can see that exactly where the haze was, we had the flattening. Uh, and again, another Scheinflug images now, now from Sirius. But for our surprise, I'll just come back here. You can see how Scheinflug measure the topography. So it was a bit uh, irregular at the center. But then for our surprise, this is the OCT based topography. And what we could see was a very regular central astigmatism, actually. So we had now uh, different, uh, different technologies bring us different results. And in this specific case, we knew that uh, for Scheinflug Hayes was or, or is, uh, has a limitation. So, so we consider this exam from OCT the real, the real or the most close from what we thought. Uh, so this was the case where the OCT changed our management. Actually, there were two surgical options that we thought about. Uh, and those options were the 
dependent on the pattern of the ocular surface. So uh, we would perform a PTK if we had a regular astigmatism or a regular topography, uh, while we could have done a wave guided PRK, for example, for uh, irregular anterior surface. So this case, PTK was preferred from the reasons I told you, because we had uh, a regular topography on OCT. And here uh, in the post-op period, uh, as you can see, the haze improved. And also visual acuity uh, show us now a more regular surface. So this could be achieved. And, and this was a, a important case for us uh, that we realized OCT can be very helpful. Uh, and lastly here, I will show two cases where the OCT can be very helpful in the screening of keratocorns. So here, a patient uh, who came because he had had uh, previous diagnose, diagnosis of keratoconus uh, for other colleague. So he came for a second option. And we observed a corner that although had a little bit of, a little bit, no, the corner had a loss of regularity. Uh, it also had reduced reduced thickness. So if I'm not wrong, if I, it was 480 micro here. Uh, and this image from Scheinflug uh, showing a bed D of 0 0.97, so normal, completely normal. And this is the fantastic high resolution image from, from the MS-39 that we could see. And then we perform it, in this case, uh, the OCT uh, with MS-39. and our main purpose here was to check the epithelial map. And you can see here on the right corner, low, a completely normal epithelial map. Then now we had another parameter that we took also into account to reassure the patient that here, uh, that was probably not a keratoconus. Uh, so all the devices uh, had the same answer. Uh, it's important just about the epithelial maps in OCT uh, of course, it can be an additional tool to screen keratoconus, uh, but it's just important to remember that screening is a method to identify the disease before it presents signs or any symptom or a visual acuity changes. But this is not the same as diagnosis. So uh, normally screening methods has a high negative predictive, predictive value. So uh, when we see that it's normal, this would be probably the case. So that why this case was uh, very, uh, that OCT with epithelial map was very helpful in this case. And finally, a curious uh, case uh, also regarding uh, the use of epithelial map in keratoconus. Uh, so a patient uh, with a topography, he had a very high asphericity, as you can see, minus 0.58 in Scheinflug, and the, the bow tie was uh, a bit truncated. There was a superior, inferior, around 1.5 diopters difference uh, be between the central area. And uh, the patient had a completely abnormal uh, bad D. So some would say that would be over 1.2 or 1.6, depending on the sensibility and the specificity here. The patient had 2.18, so completely abnormal. Uh, and also biomechanical parameters, uh, completely abnormal. So the patient had keratoconus uh, from these devices. But then, uh, from this perspective, I would say, but then, uh, with the epithelial thickness, we had a completely normal profile. This is the image from the patient. You can see the, the thickness uh, very regular in the whole cornea. And just an, as an example, uh, this is not the image from the patient, but in an advanced case of keratoconus, that's normally what, not necessarily advanced, but in keratoconus is that perspective we would see. So we see we can see the, the posterior flow changes, but also the epithelial changes. Uh, so the thinning on the apex of the cornea as Dan Reistein described it as a Dunnett pattern. But uh, here again, coming back to our patient, we did not find any, any of those uh, 
patterns or signs in our patients. So the patient really had uh, a, a normal uh, epithelial map. So that uh, case, especially after if you, uh, the other uh, uh, panelists could comment their, their option, their opinion on this case, uh, because it, I would like to learn actually, uh, but that's what we call a low, keratoc low K keratoconus. So it would be a keratoconus, but with low K. And the interesting point here, the patient had a normal epithelial map. So we believe this case would also not be progressive. So uh, here I'm saying something that is uh, uh, not consensus because we don't have studies to prove that so far, but uh, maybe uh, epithelial map in future can give us a, a, a tip, let's say, if a keratoconus would be progressive or not. We, uh, we can speak a bit of this later, but we also, we always wanted a tool to, to, to in one visit, bring this answer. And of course, if the cornea is uh, changing, the likelihood of having a telio change uh, would be higher. But here specifically, so we classify this as a low K keratoconus with a normal epithelial map. <clears throat> And, uh, but this shows exactly how the new technologies uh, do not always agree from our perspective that we have nowadays. And of course, we have a lot to learn on this, but for sure, the epithelial map and the whole evaluation that the OCT technology can bring us together with the posterior float add a lot of information for us in this case. So as a final message, uh, the epithelial map is an important additive tool for keratoconus screening. Uh, as I said, screening is different from diagnosis. And the combination of a high resolution OCT and placido technology may help us in the management, such as complications. Uh, as, I, as I show you, this is particularly uh, helpful as well post cross linking because due to light scattering the OCT uh, may be uh, very maybe you know it is very helpful uh, to evaluate uh, corners that have a slight or a strong opacity in cross linking patients they normally present a haze post operatively so the pachymetry is better assessed with uh, OCT so thank you very much for your attention. Excellent, Emilio. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation as, as usual and as expected from you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now we have a question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. So if uh, any one of the attendees wants to ask any question, you can just uh, post it on the Q&A box. Uh, in the top, uh, in the bottom of, of your screen. Um, now, Emilio, I, I have a question for you. Um, you, you. You showed very well the um, importance of combin combining the placido and, uh, 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 and the OCT, which was actually a, a dream that came through by, by CSO. Uh, and now we know that uh, many other uh, companies are following in the same track and we're going to see many of these combinations later on but CS already made a very long uh, step ahead uh, so the question is uh, comparing to Shanflug you know the Shanflug was uh, the golden standard for the last I would say 10-15 years and we all used it we all learned from it how would you uh, compare the um, uh, Shanflug uh, versus the uh, OCT in, uh, let's say, screening patients for refractive surgery? Uh, yes, it's a, it's a very, very good question because uh, we, we, as you said, Pentacan or Scheinflug or other Scheinflug devices were our gold standard for many time. What I said, here we, we have the luck of having all of the devices, so we are learning one uh, from one and for, for the other at the same time. And both can have variations, both have uh, advantages and disadvantages. But uh, with uh, OCT, we can have something unique that we don't have with other technologies. 
so far, that is the epithelial map. So we can both access uh, the posterior float, which in this case is more reliable because we can measure better the, the, the bachymetry, but also we have uh, the epithelial map. So uh, it is a very complete tool, I would say, for, for evaluating anterior segment. And especially if you deal with uh, complications uh, after refractive surgery, and the management, uh, or even for uh, cross-linking practice where you have usually a lot of haze, this is very, very helpful because it brings us answers that with, shine, with other technologies we wouldn't have. And from, from your experience with the, with the epithelial maps, uh, can the epithelial map help you in uh, Diagnosing the, the, the diagnosing the stage of keratoconus, uh, early versus moderate versus advanced. Is there a quantitative tool here? Yeah, it, it's hard. I think we are learning a lot uh, from this. We don't have the definitive answers because also epithelium has a lot of variability. So the ocular surface can bring different results. What we are what we would like to see is a normal uh, epithelial profile. So this would say as the corner probably is not progressing, but as I said, this is a very controversial. Uh, when I just mentioned in the, 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 in the presentation, but a tool that everyone, I'm, I'm sure all of us would like to have is a tool that when the patient comes from the first time on the office, uh, that we could say to the patient, okay, you are progressing, okay, you are not progressing. And we don't have this tool so far. What we do right now is, okay, uh, we ask for the patient, you come back in three months, one month, six months, depending on our assessment. And then the patient come for the second, third visit, and then we are able to, to say, okay, you don't have a progressive disease so far, or you do have. Uh, with epithelial map, I'm not saying this is, uh, uh, this is true, or uh, because we are just learning from this right now. But imagine that the cornea is changing. Some people, some colleagues are already trying to evaluate if these changes uh, would reflect on the epithelium. I mean, if the epithelium is completely normal, probably uh, this would say us that the disease is not progressing. But as I said, this is just a hypothesis and we need to prove this in the future. But at least we have a, a hope that someday we can have a tool uh, or we have already, uh, who knows, to tell if a corner is progressive or not based on only one assessment. Yeah. Excellent. So we have a question here on the, on the question and answer box coming from Enrique de, de la Torre. Uh, the question says, uh, as we all know, hardware is just a part of the device's usefulness. Can you please talk about software update in refractive surgery screening? and keratoconus follow-up in particular for the series. Thank you. So the question basically says, can you, can you talk a little bit about the updates in the software uh, detect the screening for keratoconus? Yeah, maybe this would be better answered by the CSO team. Uh, I would leave these questions for them. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll leave this question and answer it later in the, in the, uh, in the webinar. Um, Emilio, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Uh, now we're going to move to our next topic uh, from uh, Dr. Fabrizio Zeri. Uh, Fabrizio um, uh, from the Bekocca University in Milan. I know he just arrived from Milan a few minutes ago. Uh, Fabrizio is an extensive researcher and he has too many publications on dry eye and contact lenses, especially quality of vision and different types of IOM. And Fabrizio is going to address uh, the very important topic of uh, enhancing uh, tear film assessment. Fabrizio, please. So uh, thanks, uh, Hela, for uh, the really nice presentation. And thanks again to CSO for inviting me to this um, uh, very, very interesting webinar with so good speakers. So um, I'm going to talk today about enhancing the tear film assessment by the dry eye report. 
uh, there's disclosure. So these are the key points that I'm gonna touch. So the uh, dry eye uh, disease, um, just few slides about the dry eye disease uh, and the announcing of the tier of assessment. And then I will move to the dry eye report. So let's start. Dry eye, dry eye disease is an you Please share your screen. Oh, sure, sure, sorry. Sorry, Alain. We like to see you, but we also want yeah, to yeah, see yeah, you. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. I made a mistake. Oh, great. So, dry report. Great. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, good, good. Sorry again. So, okay, so these are the key points that I'm gonna touch. So the dry eye disease and announcing the pure film assessment and dry eye report. So let's start with the dry eye disease is something, uh, it, it has been considered a maze, like a puzzle for a long time. And it is still a maze, I think. And uh, so it, it's a big issue. Uh, if you look at this statement, for example, we can understand how big is this, uh, the dry haze disease. So basically it's a global problem. Everybody, every country is, uh, is affected. And at least 300, uh, more than 300 million people worldwide are affected by the dry haze disease. And, uh, it's one of the most frequent causes why patients ask for a visit by uh, ophthalmologists, optometrists all around the world. So I think it's, a, uh, it's, an, it's an, inter an interesting topic also for a practice surgeon, contact lens practitioner, and so on. Um, how big is the prevalence? If you look at the prevalence, it's not easy to answer to, uh, uh, to reply to to answer to the uh, the figures of prevalence why um, basically I think the, the most important things is the prevalent because the prevalence is calculated in different way uh, so for example if you look at symptoms if you look at uh, or a physician diagnosis or the diagnosis criteria uh, I think the the prevalence change and the figures are amazing uh, the figures change from five to fifty percent of all prevalence uh, in, in, in the population. So it's a very big, it's a very big gap. Uh, it's a very big uh, figure. Uh, so how we can assess the dry eye disease, basically we can move with questionnaire or schimmel like test or uh, for example, tear meniscus eight, or uh, we, we can look at uh, breakup time in several ways. We can measure osmolarity. We can measure, uh, for example, the staining with different uh, stains like uh, such as, for example, fluorescein or lysamine green, or um, we can look at the meibomian gland. Uh, clearly, it's not easy uh, to go uh, to go around this this kind of test because there is no uh, an uh, an available gold standard. Uh, clearly, uh, if we look at, for example, this uh, the whole uh, typhus juice from typhus, uh, we can see that the sensitivity and specificity of different tests is different. And uh, uh, the reason why uh, they are so different is because. Uh, uh, there is a certain overlap between normal and dry population. So if the, the, the distribution of the dry eye in normal population is overlapped, clearly, uh, if we put a cutoff in a, some way, uh, we will uh, get a false negative percentage of people, but also true positive, but also true negative and false positive. So, but if we move, if we shift, for example, the cutoff clearly, uh, because the, the two distribution are overlapped, we, we can get a different amount of false negative or true positive, for example. Uh, so let's have a look at the definition of the, the dry eye disease uh, as um, has been, we, we know that it has been changed from TFOS, that is one of the most important reference uh, group of researchers, scientists, clin clinicians. And for example, if you, uh, re uh, if you read the uh, definition, the dry eyes now is defined as a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by the loss of anastasis of the tear fill uh, accompany, uh, with, with ocular symptoms uh, in which tear film instability and hyperpolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage play and, and its surgical rules. So clearly, if we want to check, if you want to diagnose the dry eye disease, we have to look 
all these aspects of dry definition. I think this is very interesting uh, graph, so figure uh, propo proposed by uh, these two in which we can move around the diagnosis of dry eye disease in, in different way. So they uh, um, highlight the fact that if you wanna diagnose the dry eye disease, you have to look at symptomatology here, and we can use different tests. And the, the most important in terms of evidence base are the DEQ5 and the OSD as well. But also we have to measure homeostasis markers like a non-invasive non breakup time, osmolarity, uh, and ocular surface staining. Uh, and if you want to uh, get information about the subtype, cl subtype classification of, of, of the eye disease, we should look around the ev ev evaporative um, dry, but also uh, dry that is linked to aqueous deficiency. Um, so if you want to uh, perform the best assessment, you have to look according to the dry, uh, the, the TIFOS 2, uh, all these aspects. But if you want to move uh, forward and, and enhance the, uh, the dry assessment, maybe we should also uh, um, uh, more, moreover, than, more than covering different aspects, we should also look at uh, a different approach to the uh, uh, to your uh, assessment. For example, a qualitative uh, assessment, uh, I think is worse than a quantitative assessment that can provide us numbers, figures uh, that we compare with, uh, for example, uh, um, a distribution values that we can, uh, so normative data. But also the non-invasiveness of technique is really important as we, um, uh, we are gonna uh, see in a, in, a, uh, in a while. Also, we should move towards tests that are clinically performable. Uh, and, and so uh, we should use something that, that can be used in, in a clinical setting. And finally, uh, we should use something that is automated instead of uh, using uh, something that is linked strongly to the experience of the, of the clinic, clinicians, for example. This is the reason why uh, lots of manufacturers uh, of instruments uh, provided um, such as some some devices to to try to put together all these things. One one of these devices is the dry eye report. Uh, clearly, we have um, in the dry eye report from CSO we have an hardware. Usually, is a placido disc based uh, uh, instrument, so can be different. Can, they they have different placido based uh, uh, instrument, but they work all together on the same platform that we call the dry eye report. So the dry eye report. Is is a collection of standalone examination and uh, can, that can allow us to uh, from different tests. Clearly also, um, we, um, apart of placido this based to, uh, topography or uh, uh, topographer, we have an infrared light camera that, for example, can perform can allow us to perform a mebography and also a moving lens able to to, var to uh, vary the uh, the depths so the, the the field the focus and the field of the uh, of the acquisition uh, clearly all is linked to a software uh, that can uh, um, allow us to perform different specific tests um, for example, these are the tests available in the system, so in the dry report. So we have clearly an ocular surface disease, uh, disease index, so the OSD implemented in the software, but also a device that uh, um, for the ocular redness analysis, another device for meibomian gland analysis, another one for tear meniscus analysis for the tear meniscus aid measurements, and also uh, devices that um, to measure the breakup time in a non-invasive way, and also a device, uh, more than a device, a way to report the osmolarity that is, uh, is performed with other tests. Uh, the clinician can, at the end, uh, score the level and the, the severity of dry eye uh, with a classification in the five level steps. So let's have a look at the ration of the dry eye. Uh, report. So the rational is, uh, uh, we, we can explain the rational if you look at, um, if you move back to the uh, uh, TIFOS uh, diagram in which we, uh, in which we, 
we can see, for example, that it's important to check the symptomatology, and that's the reason why they put the OSD inside, but also the, um, uh, the uh, tear film stability. And this is, can be done through uh, the non-invasive breakup time, but also osmolarity, and we can report the, what, what we measure with uh, other instruments for osmolarity. Also, we can check the ocular redness, so the state, the, 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 the health of the ocular surface, and also the uh, tear meniscus. That is what is, this is very important to, uh, to measure the amount, the volume of, of tear, and also the meibomian gland uh, assessment that can uh, perform to check if the problem is evaporative or not. So, is, is it linked to lipid or not? Clearly, all, all these tests, uh, so the question is for all these tests, are they reliable, are they accurate, are they, uh, in terms of repeat, uh, repeatability, are they good or not? Clearly, they are new, some, some of those are new, so sometimes we don't have uh, we don't have information, that's the reason why one year ago, we started, roughly one year ago, we started at Comi, that my, we, uh, these are the uh, my colleague at Comib, so that the center in uh, University of Milano Bicocca, where we are uh, started uh, forming different uh, different uh, experiment, different study. So we are carrying on uh, in, in, in progress, a lot of study on your film. So I would like to sh to share with you just a couple of these studies. One is on tear meniscus aid, and the other one on uh, non-invasive breakup time. So let's start with the tear meniscus aid study. Um, so what we are doing now and what we did in the, in the past, uh, this is a, a paper. Uh, so let, let's have a look before to, uh, before to uh, show you some data. I would like to show you a little bit about tear meniscus aid assessment. As I told you before, this is a device that allow us with it in the dry air report system to measure the Age of the tear meniscus that is uh, on the lower uh, lead, and we can measure in different point with with a, a system with a rule, basically with a ruler, uh, the, uh, the age of the tear meniscus. Um, as the TFOS stated, the tear meniscus age is the most direct approach to study the tear film volume, and the normality for the uh, the tear meniscus age is roughly 0.2, 0.3 millimeters and dry eye is usually something that is below 0.2. Uh, but these are data from slit lump tear meniscus aids measurement. So what about what about for example uh, system different system like for example the dry eye report. But before this uh, the question is is this kind of measurements reliable for example? And that's exactly what we studied. So we try to analyze the inter inter observer reliability, the margin lower tier meniscus age, uh, through this, this, this new system of acquisition, so the dry air report. So what we, what we did, we took um, a pool of images that we uh, already uh, acquired and stored in our database in the clinics. And uh, so we uh, enrolled two, uh, four observers, uh, two graduated in, in optometry and two optometry with more than 20 years of clinical experience. And we asked them to measure uh, the, the, the tear meniscus aid in three different positions on the lower tear meniscus, uh, one central here, uh, they were able to do that uh, overlapped on the screen, uh, basically a, a, a transparent, semi-transparent sheet uh, in which they could uh, check, for example, the position, the first position, the second position, 30 degrees uh, nasally or temporally, depending on the eye, and the other one on the 30 degrees on the other side. And they have to measure in three different positions the tear meniscus aid in this way. Okay, uh, so let's have a look very quickly at the result in terms of inter-observer reliability. And uh, here we see uh, what, uh, what we call junior. So we have two, uh, first, two people, uh, junior people, so just graduated, and two senior people. And we'll, uh, uh, we'll look here at the average and certain deviation of the measurements of the, the four people here uh, in the central position of the tumor 
for the right eye, for the left eye, or the nasal position for the right and left and temporal and, and so on. So as we can see here, and maybe you can, um, you can uh, maybe detect from the data, it seems that there is, not seems, but it, it's, uh, there is a significant a significant difference between the measurement. But if you see the number here, the clinical difference between uh, the, uh, the people, the observers, is not so much. And if you look at the uh, uh, ICC, so in the intracal correlation coefficient, they are very good, they are pretty good. So it seems that there is not a big difference in terms of uh, clinical difference in, in measuring the tyramine scosase, as well as the reliability in terms of ICC is very good. What about the intra-observer reliability? In other, in other words, if I perform twice the, uh, the measurements uh, with a uh, different, uh, with a 15, day, uh, 15 days of delay, what happened? So these are, uh, in, in, this, in this graph, you see the first measure, the test, and the retest. And as you can see here, the, the graphs and the bars are very, very similar. So um, although some of those are significant, but once again, the, the clinical significance of the data seems very, very, uh, very, very low. So, so the clinical significance is, is, is uh, neg 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 negligible compared to the statistical difference. Once again, I'm, uh, we measure the intraclass correlation coefficient, and we can see the intraclass co correlation coefficient uh, can allow us to state that the intra-observer reliability uh, of the theorem is because aid measurement seems very good. So for example, just to conclude for this kind of study, uh, so the inter-observer reliability in assessing the theorem in A by the dry air report, uh, report appeared very good in terms of ICCs, uh, either centrally, nasally, or temporally. Uh, also the inter-observer reliability appears extremely good, uh, extremely good too. Uh, but another another point that I didn't stress maybe in the last slides is the more experienced clinicians did not show better ICC values. So this means that if you put, for example, a young a young graduate, uh, for example, a physician or an optometrist, a clinicians, maybe uh, maybe the, the the measurements could be very very good as well. Okay, let's move on the other on the other topics. So the non-invasive bracket time that is very in interesting. Maybe is the is, is the most uh, studied uh, test for dry dry assessment ever. And we have uh, mountains. We have uh, thousands of papers on this argument. But let's have a look how it works. So in in the dry air report, it works in this way. So we have a placido disc technology. We projected the placido disc on the cornea. We know very well, and we measure the interval of time that elapses between a com complete blink and the appearance of the first break in the, in the tear film. Clearly, the, the first break is detected by a distortion uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the circles here uh, of the placido disc. Um, Generally, the time uh, with a non-invasive bracket time is lower, is longer than uh, fluorescent bracket time. So the invasive bracket time, the classical bracket time, and as we can see in, in a while, our data demonstrated also this point. So we, we we got the same the same data. So these are the data for normal population, LT population from Nichols, and. Uh, Clearly, the advantage of a system like that is that we can automatically assess uh, we, in the keratoscopic image the, uh, the, the break. So the system allows us to do that automatically. Let's have a look at an example of this. For example, here we have the reflection of the placido disc, of the cornea, and uh, we, uh, the system is measuring automatically first break that should appear here, roughly here. And we can, the system provide us, the software provide us also a backup time map uh, that we could, could not measure before this kind of, of uh, softwares. And so we can uh, have different um, markers of the, uh, the breaks. But what about the um, what about the uh, agreement, for example, of this system with other system? What about the agreement between the automatic and manual measurements? These, these are the questions that we that arise us in, in 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 our group, and we started to try to reply to this to 
to answer to this, to this question. For example, in this first study, we analyzed the agreement or repeatability of three uh, non-invasive breakup time measurements. The first study is on 30 subjects, pretty, pretty normal in terms of tier film, but very young, so they are students basically. We uh, use the Polaris from CSO, the uh, Easy Tears from Easy Tier, the, uh, and the uh, dry report using a keratoscope uh, device. Uh, these are the devices that we use uh, in a random order. Uh, and because the, uh, break, uh, the uh, fluorescent breakup time is invasive, we left the fluorescent breakup time at the end while this, this three non-invasive breakout time were randomly uh, um, assessed at the beginning. Uh, after uh, two hours of difference, we repeated in a, a further session on the same day, this kind of measurements. So let's have a look at the results. I will show just one eye because uh, we cl clearly the eyes are associated. We, don't, we didn't pull together for a statistical reason that we, were, we know very well. So we, I'm, I'm providing here just, just the left eye data. And uh, what about the, uh, the data? Here we have the fluorescent breakup time, here we have the dry eye report, and as we know from literature, usually non-invasive breakup time assessment uh, give us uh, a, a longer time, and that's exactly what we found as well. But we found a difference between them. So in other words, these systems are not equal, especially if we uh, make comparison, you will see that the non-invasive breakup time are different from fluorescent breakup time, but also this one is different from this, for example. So there are different instruments bring us different uh, results. Uh, what about the uh, test with test reliability? Uh, so the reliability of the test. Here we see that, for example, uh, not so much difference in, 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 there is between the test and retest. So we measure again that interclass correlation coefficient. We, we measure more than this, but I'm, I'm showing just, just this, uh, these um, coefficients. And they are pretty good, especially the non invasive tests are pretty good. Also, the dry report. Instead, the fluorescent breakup time is pretty bad in terms of uh, reliability. So, final, uh, so the, conclude the second the second study that I'm, I'm showing you. So bracket I measure with fluorescent result is significantly shortened compared to all non-invasive back breakup time procedures. Non-invasive uh, non breakup time devices appear performing very similarly with the dry eyes report, uh, resulting in, in, a, in a slightly longer beauty respect to other uh, non-invasive breakup devices. So it's a little bit longer, that's our result. And uh, reviewability resulted better for non-invasive breakup time procedure, all of, the, of, of those, than for us in breakup time. So just to finish, I wanna show you the last experiment that we, uh, we performed in, uh, in our uh, lab. And uh, once again, we, we were very interested in the algorithm. Is the algorithm, uh, of the uh, dry eye report accurate or not. So if I perform with the algorithm and if I measure manually, is there a difference? So we took 95 videos, very quite good videos in terms of quality, of video quality, uh, previously recorded in our database. And we asked uh, again to one, uh, um, junior, let's say junior uh, assessor or observer and one senior assessor. And um, we uh, asked to them to uh, assess the video and measure the backup time uh, in a random order uh, uh, twice, but I'm presenting you just the results between the manual and automatic assessment. So this is, is the, uh, what, what we asked. So we use another, another clearly another software, not the dry report software, because you, you, you can see the, the results. So we exported all the video in, in, in another software and we showed the experimenter, the observer, the videos. So these are the correlation between, for example, automated non-invasive breakup time and manual non-invasive breakup time. They're pretty good. So both, either for, either for junior or senior observers. So they are pretty good in terms of coefficient or uh, correlation coefficient but, and, cor and correlation, uh, coefficient of determination. So they are very good. But if we see at the, uh, at the distribution, we see that there was a uh, significant difference between the automatic uh, assessment of non-invasive breakup time and the manual assessment. So just to conclude, 
there was a strong correlation between automated and manual non-invasive breakup time, but uh, a significant difference between the average non-invasive breakup time uh, was found depending by the observer. So we have to take uh, uh, notes to uh, uh, bear in mind that this is what happened with a different instrument. Again, different instrument uh, give us different results. So general conclusion, and I think I'm, I'm in the time, so just for some question. Uh, so the dry disease is a big unsolved issue. So it, more than 300 million people worldwide are affected. Uh, clearly we need a, a clever set, a clever and quick set of uh, battery of tests. So a battery of tests that can be clinically performable and uh, maybe they are better if uh, non-invasive, uh, if, if they are automatic. Uh, so we should try to announce the, so this is not, this is not the end, this is the beginning maybe. So we are, uh, we are going, we are proceeding in, uh, in uh, enhancing the, the tier of film assessment, but this is the, the way. So non-invasive test, uh, uh, automatic test that look at different aspect of tier film. Uh, the by report is something that can be useful, can be useful because it provides us some of, of those uh, an enhancement solution that I highlighted here. But also with this some pre uh, preliminary data that I show from our lab, we are observing uh, that different, uh, so the, the different uh, uh, techniques, different instruments bring us different results. So be careful. So dry eye report is good, but we have to uh, reason to things in a different way. And, and because if we compare that data with the old, data that we have from fluorescent breakup time or our other tests, maybe we have different results. I think that's it. And uh, so it's a little bit is in the puzzle of dry eye uh, assessment that we have, I put here. So thank you for your attention. And uh, the time I think is good. Uh, thank you so much Fabrizio. That was very comprehensive and uh, you dealt, you are dealing with a very, very tough subject and uh, it's really important and very common that we see patients with dry eye and you don't know what to do. Now, at least we know what we can do. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, and uh, I'll go with the first question, Fabrizio. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on how we do the non-invasive uh, breakup time test and what kind of keratoscope is, is being used in this test? Okay, so if I uh, understood correctly, you're asking about the, uh, the kind of keratoscope, right? Yes. Okay, clearly, if you look, for example, at the result of the three tests that I showed you before, so the three different non-invasive breakup time, uh, one aspect that uh, raised to our attention, that uh, ar uh, arises to our attention is the fact that they gave us different results, so why? So clearly there are some aspects. The keratoscope I think is one of the most important uh, because for example, the, uh, the size of the keratoscope but also the, the luminance of the keratoscope can affect the, term, the, the, the time. For example, if you put more light, clearly you, you can induce more tearing and that can affect, but also the size. If you look at non-invasive breakup time with a very small Placido, Placido disc, clearly you are observing just as a small part of cornea or the corneal surface. So you have to look at a wide, wide part. Also the, the, the size of the rings are affecting because you can detect the, the break uh, depending on the size of the ring as well. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. We have, we have time for one more question and I can see one question coming here in the question and answer box. Yeah. It says, uh, can the non-invasive breakup time be performed on a contact lens? And what kind of information can we achieve uh, performing this type of measurement? Okay. Um, clearly, uh, the, you can. The, the answer is you can. You can perform non-invasive breakup time on the contour lens surface, but it provides, uh, provides us a very different information. So, for example, you are not measuring, you are not measuring the tear film. Uh, but you're measuring the pre-lens tear film that is basically, it's completely different. So for example, there is no mucin layer on the tear film, uh, on the pre-lens tear film. So you're measuring something that is, 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 is a, a thinner, that so maybe 
few micro, microns, uh, two, three microns compared to seven, eight microns of the normal tear film. And uh, also, maybe you are measuring something that is linked to the material of contact lenses. In fact, this kind of test is performing to assess the wettability in video of or the wettability in vivo of contact lenses. This is one of the way we can uh, uh, assess the wettability of, of a specific material in vivo, not in vitro. So I think it's something different, but we can perform and we do actually yeah. in, in clinical practice and also in research, in research labs. Excellent, Fabrizio. And then we have one more question, but I think it referred to the same thing. It says, um, did you, hi Fabrizio, did you perform dry eye test with uh, HI contact lenses in the eye, with the contact lenses in the eye? I think is the same. I think is the same. We do, but for different reason. Yeah, we do, but for different reason, not for the dry assessment. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Fabrizio. Very Thanks. much. Thanks a lot. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, and then we're going to move uh, to the, our next uh, talk uh, by Dr. Uh, Professor Rohit Chetty uh, from Bangalore, India. Uh, Rohit is going to uh, tackle the uh, topic of MS39, a new hybrid workstation for the new normal. Dr. Shetty is a professor, is a professor at the Siri uh, Davaraj Medical College in Bangalore, India, and he's the vice chairman of Narayana Nizaralaya I Institute. I hope I'm saying it properly. Perfect, Dr. Bella. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks. Uh... Uh, the CSO for this uh, opportunity. Uh, these are my financial disclosure. I have nothing specific to, uh, to talk today. Uh, these are COVID times. I'm sure uh, a lot of you are uh, worried about many things, aerosols, and uh, when, you're, when you're going back to your practice. So one of the major issues is when you're using multiple tools is always about contamination. How, how these aerosols or droplets contaminate your tools. And as refractive cataract surgeons, we are now forced to use multiple tools for different things, from epithelial mapping to topographies and everything. So my talk is in this new normal, when we go into this new dimension, how do we use one instead of all these things uh, which has been done? Uh, this, that's my talk today. This is uh, a topography-based uh, uh, placido disc and uh, OCT-based uh, diagnostics, which is a combination of two. So it gives you the whole eye measurement, uh, both the refractive power, that's a base mix of placido and OCT. And like all other topographers of modern day, it looks at the elevation, curvatures, and all these maps. So what are, the, what are the new features it has? You, of course, you can look at the select imaging, which I think Emilio did show. All these factors which we have seen, the anterior chamber, the stromal measurements, what the topographies can do, uh, refractive planning, keratosconus screening, and all this uh, wavefront analysis and multiple things I'll discuss as I keep moving. It also has a lens biometry, it uses a ray tracing principle and uh, of course, like any OCT, it also comes with the glaucoma analysis uh, and pupillometry. And uh, the dry eye was just discussed now, so I'm not going to go into that at this point of time. The way I'm going to discuss is, uh, I'm going to touch upon what is new, what's the true picture, the real truth, and the summary. So this is the way I'm going to run through this uh, maps. So the maps are uh, quite straightforward. Uh, you have a corneal thickness map, you have an anterior curvature map, anterior elevation map. This is important. What it does is, it uh, this is your epithelium. It removes the epithelium, and this is without the epithelium. The stromal changes what you get. So this is something very, very useful, and uh, I have some cases as we move on. And you can use different uh, averaging of your scans based on what kind of uh, what kind of what kind of imaging you want. And this is a screenshot you get multiple. Uh, uh, patterns. Uh, like I said, this is an epithelial maps, and you can see your uh, anti elevation, the stromal elevation. So, this is with the epithelium, this is without the epithelium. So, how does it measure? Uh, again, uses the uh, OCT for the measurement, and uh, 
And what's interesting is you have close to a nine millimeter zone uh, uh, epithelium uh, mapping, which it gets. So when you have a nine millimeter bigger zone, so you have a good amount of data, which is, which is gets covered. And uh, this is uh, a very interesting picture. We can see that this is your Bowman's and you can see how irregular the Bowman's is. This is post uh, refractive surgery. And you can even look at how fine this uh, imaging are with your, in terms of Bowman's. And if you just try to, uh, you have a, a nice uh, uh, tool which gives you a place to enlarge it. So you can actually enlarge it. You can place your cursor and you can actually enlarge this and each image pixel, you can try to see what is really happening. So there are a lot of fine, uh, nice, unique features out here. Uh, this is a picture which is shot by a wildlife photographer, uh, 200 kilometers from where I come from. And uh, people who are used to uh, seeing the jungle book will know this picture. It's a very, very rare picture of uh, the, the, the black cat or the black panther. We call it Bagheera in uh, the Jungle Book. So what are the unique features of this? This is a map which is quite unique. There's a new software. You have your uh, anterior and posterior surface. Uh, there's a new map called as a Gaussian posterior elevation. It's a mathematical derivation of a, of a different, of like your tangential and sagittal. They use the Gaussian uh, curvature maps and your posterior elevation versus normal, the epithelial thickness, the stromal thickness, and from the deviation. Basically, a lot of new features are there, and of course, a lot of new indices out here, which we'll go, we'll discuss as we move on. And this is your keratoconus maps, these epithelium, the elevations, and posterior elevations, and, uh, and it also gives you, uh, it's very interesting is earlier it was only with the Pentacam, now also has an ABCD map, and the partial thickness uh, changes map the from the center to the uh, six millimeter zone. So many things have been loaded into this system. So this is uh, for us to use. So people are used to uh, so say a Pentacam or a Cirrus, you have a mix of both of them out here. And uh, this is uh, something very interesting is uh, this, uh, this map, which I'm going to discuss uh, in the next slide. What it means is red on red or you know, this is your red circle out here. And there are a lot of uh, indices out here. For example, thinnest epithelial thickness, the stromal thickness, the thickness minimal, and all your curvature maps. These are all the points which you see here. If it falls inside the red circle, that means that you are going to have a suspicious of keratoconus because if you fall in a normal thing, it has to fall outside here, not in the red circle here. So it's very, very uh, intuitive and a very nice way of looking at all your, uh, all your uh, risk factors. Where do they actually fall? Do they fall in uh, the center or do they fall really outside? So this is uh, something very new and this is just a magnified view of what it looks like. <coughs> and uh, you can see that this is the <coughs> elevation. This is an anterior elevation that includes the epithelium also with the epithelium. This is an anti, this is anti formal elevation minus the epithelium. That's, that's something which is very unique. And you have uh, a Zernike analysis out maps out here, which also gives you uh, a total order aberrations, the posterior and anterior. If you combine it with the pyramus or an uh, Osiris T, which is an abrometry, then you probably get a complete uh, uh, aberrations of the complete, complete profile. We published uh, some work on epithelial Zernike. Uh, that was very interesting uh, concept. What we thought was that having an epithelial Zernike uh, helps in understanding the aberrations of your epithelial maps. So very interesting concept here is that they have an epithelial Zernike plus your corneal Zernike. So you have both of it together. Most of the time we are only used to seeing this and not this, but you have both. So you can actually compare. And this is how an, this is an epithelial Zernike map. That means that it, your comas and higher order, lower order aberrations, all can be derived from the epithelium. This is from the epithelium. And uh, you can see in keratoconus, it's quite noisy compared to the, uh, the normal out here. So that's something very, very exciting because uh, tomorrow, you know, you're looking at an early changes or a certain uh, 
changes, you can probably even see what is happening uh, in the from first or for refractive screening. What is the true picture? The question always asks is, is this in uh, FFKC? The true picture always is measured from the epithelium. But what we really need is we should be measuring from the garments or the stromal surface. But most of the current day topographies do not do that. So because there is inherent limitation to dissociate the, the epithelium and, uh, and the stromal surface, we published some work on, uh, we did a mathematical correlation of uh, how do you do it. We call it as a Bowman's topography where we, we uh, virtually dissociated the epithelium from the, the, from the stroma. And we were able to create an epithelial, uh, to create a stromal topography. And this is something which we've been working on. Uh, we are quite excited about uh, this concept uh, uh, with this MS39, for example, if you're looking at uh, your epithelial thickness here, and you can see that this curvature is not right on the tangential anterior. But if we correlate with this, there is a lot of thickening out here, but this is related. So your tangential curvature includes the epithelial maps, but if you virtually dissociate it, the blue greens are normal, it is normal. So there is no actual elevation, but when you have an epithelium, anterior elevation is with epithelium, the stromal elevation is without. So when you have without, it's normal, with epithelium is abnormal. That is because your epithelium is irregular. So that just at one look, you know that your whole cornea, which looks irregular here, is actually a very regular surface at the stromal level. This is your stromal level. And what you're interested in is at the stroma. We are not interested at the epithelium because epithelium is just, it's just a masking agent. So this is very important because many times in your new normal, we are always uh, suspicious. If you can't match two machines uh, imaging, it becomes very suspicious about what's happening. And this is what I explained. And uh, I also explained about this, uh, this whole maps about, you know, how this indices can really help you in understanding uh, the new uh, uh, parameters. So let's look at some cases. Uh, this is a patient who had a small change out here. And uh, I was not really sure the pentacam was a little suspicious. Now you look at this, the epithelium is irregular out here and the stromal elevation is normal and the post elevation, not much of a change. So this change out here, what you're seeing is actually related to the epithelium. So at one look at it, you know the epithelium is the uh, problem. So this is a patient again with a small change out here. And you can see that from, from this map, you can see that the epithelium is irregular, the stroma is normal, the posterior surface is normal. This is actually a normal topography. But if you have, if you're using only one map, then you, this is abnormal. So you'll not be interested to do anything. So it really helps us to understand this topography in a much better faith fashion. For example, let's look at this. This is a, this is a, this is a scan of a keratoconus. You can see that epithelium is uh, thinned out here, but that is a stromal elevation, huge elevation, matches to the posterior elevation. So the epithelium is thin, stromal, this is KC. So what happens is it helps us to understand what is really happening. And uh, you can see in this map, all your, uh, all your points are inside your red area. So this is a very important feature, very important software point, which helps us to look at what is happening. So how do we apply this in keratoconus? Of course, the epithelial maps is one big area of change. We can see that uh, this is uh, different types of uh, mapping out here for the epithelium. This is a progressive case. And you can see that we are on not only looking at just the, the anterior maps of, and or curvature maps, we are also looking at the stromal changes. Here, the stromal elevation was 39, now it's 49 to 57, though it's, it's a true progression. So it is really progressing. So you're looking at it from the stromal level instead of from the epithelium. Now look at this, there is a huge amount of progression. Now, is it really a progression? No, look at this. This was uh, this around six months, the epithelium has become thick. 
because of the epithelium has become thicker, this is actually showing it as a elevation. And now look at what does happen. The stroma is exactly the same. This is a fantastic case. There is no stromal elevation. The epithelium has become thick because of remodeling. Many times you, you reduce the inflammation. This area, which was thinner, has become thicker. And this thicker epithelium actually shows it as a elevation or your curvature changes. So these are all very, very important things because otherwise, Many times we would have done a cross-linking or repeat cross-linking, or many times we end up in a lot of problems because we have not understood the disease. So the disease of keratoconus has to be looked from the stromal point only, but not at the epithelium. But we have to dissociate the epithelium to understand what is happening at the stroma. So look at this, all the para elevation maps are exactly the same. So at one look, you know, is it a true progression or a pseudo progression? Exactly the same thing here. There is a small change of progression on the pentacam, but the epithelium is again showing hypertrophy and no change at all. It's exactly the same. Even though the pentacam is showing as an elevation, but the stroma is perfectly normal. So keratoconus will have a new understanding once we start using it because we are always used to seeing the progression from an anterior surface, which is covered with epithelium and epithelium masks, unmasks everything. So we have to now seriously start looking at keratoconus from a stromal surface because keratoconus is not an epithelial disease, it's a stromal disease. So if you have a stromal disease, you have to look at the stroma and this is the only time we are able to look at it from a stromal change. So all these maps are all trying to tell you that stroma is the focus of our work. So what is the true picture? You have an epithelial map, you have a stromal elevation, and you have to mix both of them to see if it's a real change or not, and the type of epithelium, how it's remodeling, how it's changing. Uh, it really helps to look at the uh, intact planning. This is a work done by me and my colleague, Dr. Sharon. We looked at different rings. These are freely accessible uh, Thing, uh, accessible on uh, in the journal of ophthalmology we have an icrs summary uh, it tells you based on uh, there's a nice uh, 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 nice place where you can enter all your data in and it'll tell you what type of ring you want to put but what is interesting for me is it's based on coma you can use and choose based on the coma axis you can choose uh, based on the topography axis you can do the choma axis and you can see that uh, the coma axis is 166 and incision axis if a topography is 156. So coma is what you would like to treat. If it's a significant coma, you can even choose it on that and you can enter it into your machine and that's what gets treated up. That's what gets treated. Uh, fakic lens planning for people using fakic lens, of course, from all that's other things which we have, uh, there's a huge amount of data we get. The important ones are the keratometry, thickness, the anterior chamber depth is very important. The white to white is very important. The lens rise is very important because, uh, you know, the, there are times when you have a high lens rise, then, you know, you, you, you always uh, are looking out for all these factors when you're doing your procedures. And these things can be fed into the, uh, your calculator and do the, do the, do the and, and order the lenses. Uh, post what vault is what is important. You can see that it's a beautiful ICL. Uh, it can help to look at your angles properly, the ACDs, what I mentioned already, and uh, if there's any changes of your lens vault. Uh, the few cases uh, which I want to uh, share with you is again a Bagheera peeping. Uh, I call it as the hidden mysteries. Uh, this is one case, uh, a 45 year old male had come to us complaining of glare. Uh, this is his topography in the right and the left eye. You can see that there is a change. And this glare and halos and all started recently. But when you look at the topography, you know that there is a significant amount of uh, elevation out there. Uh, and when you look at the maps, you can see that this maps has uh, epithelial change. And uh, we were worried uh, this epithelial changes this could be related to an anterior elevation, but there is an anterior elevation out there, which corresponds to the area of uh, area of 
change, which is expected. So it looks like a keratoconus, but what's interesting is keratoconus usually should have happened uh, uh, longer. It's, he's 45 years old and you can't expect him to develop keratoconus suddenly. But his stromal elevation was very minimal, uh, very, very minimal. You can just see a small elevation there and uh, compared to the significant amount of epithelial changes. Uh, we did a confocal microscopy and what was interesting here is we found a small microneuroma. We have worked a lot on microneuromas. They are part of the nerve. Uh, some patients have this neuropathic pains and there are some patients have microneuromas, but they don't have pain. And these microneuroma exactly coincided with where the epithelial changes were. That could be some irritation, chronic changes, and we had to keep him on steroids and some, and we even started him on a, a autologous serum uh, to see if it reduces his, his symptomatically better, but I'm not saying that it's completely gone. So the, all these things would have happened only because we were able to dissociate all this very well. Uh, it helps us to look at the Bauman's very well. This is a paper which we published about the Bauman's uh, micro distortions and uh, we used uh, different OCT then, we used uh, a Leica OCT uh, bioptogen and this is how it distorts your images. And uh, very interestingly, you can see that there are a lot of uh, images, refractive surgeries here, and some have wrinkles, some absolutely nothing. You can see some have wrinkles and all this, if you enlarge the image, you can see those wrinkles out here beautifully. And these images, these wrinkles have a huge impact on your quality of vision. And this explains how your uh, vision can get distorted by this. A uh, few things about the uh, changes between uh, epithelium and the nerve morphology. We combined uh, the confocal microscopy and in a lot of patients. And we believe that the nerves and epithelium have a very beautiful hemostasis. This is some of the patients who have got good nerves to poor nerves. And these are poor, and you can see how their epithelium is. So what I'm trying to say is the epithelium has a huge link to how your nerves are. And if you can see that this is a good one, and you can see this is a poor one. So your ocular surface disease has a huge impact on your quality of nerves. And if you do any surgery on it, in this case, you may have done a LASIK or a smile, you can see that the healing is completely different. The poor nerves have a poor healing, the good nerves have a good healing. So this is something very important. And this is something which we've been trying to study using this. And when you have a very poor epithelium, your quality of vision also drops. So poor nerves, poor epithelial healing, and the poor quality of vision. This is not always related to your surgeries, but is related to this. So how do we optimize this new tool? Uh, there's a, you know, you, you combine your, uh, your aberrations profiling, and if you mix it with your pyramids, there's a good chance that you can use it for your uh, MARIS. And the good thing about Schwind is that it is highly programmable. You can, call, you can build in a lot of your own abrasions map. You can select, you can use a lot of select, deselect maps. And this can be used through your uh, understanding of your topographies. To sum up, it's a mix. It's a fantastic combination of one tool, one machine. We can do multiple things. Uh, stromal mapping probably is one of the way to go because it helps to look up early uh, screening of early diseases. Uh, epithelium is a very nice fitting dress. It can hide everything, all your imperfections. We don't want anything to be hidden, nor we want anything to be enhanced. We just want something to be the true picture. And stromal mapping is a real true picture. Aberrations study from, from different direction, whether you study uh, an epithelium or you use your pyramus to look at, or osiris, to look at your total aberration, I think the way to go. And uh, Schwind already uses the pyramus and uh, a lot of this uh, aberrations, which helps us to get into a perfect system. And OCT, one good thing is that your, your outcome measures are not only looked from your anterior cornea surface anymore. Your outcome measures are looked at it from every layer. And this is something which is very exciting for me from an optical point of view, because I do, I, I, I just am very excited about optics because you look at optics from the epithelium and you know what is the status because you can do Zernike, you can do the other mapping. You look at the Bowman's layer, 
I don't think any topography today gives you the Bauman's layer changes. And if you're looking at the Bauman's layer changes and you are looking at how it works and then you're correlating, it's, it's way forward. Then you look at your stroma and then you go down your uh, changes. I uh, thank the CSO team and uh, everybody here, everybody from the organization to make this wonderful tool for our practice surgeon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Shetty. That was wonderful, uh, very impressive uh, cases. And uh, there is a question coming here for you from the audience in the Q&A box uh, from Nita Shah. It says, uh, Dr. Rohit, would, would the change in astigmatism or vision also help in suspecting progression when it is masked? Um, if I understood the correct, uh, I understood the question correctly. She's talking about the epithelium. See, if the epithelial irregularity is very high, then there is definitely a chance that it may be creating an astigmatism like picture. So that is what I said. You look at your topography now also from your stomal surface like the cases i showed you the two patients had a definite progression on your topography but when you look at it from the epithelium and the stromal mapping there was no progression it was just that epithelium has become thicker or it had changed and your stromal thickness did not actually show any change if the stroma does not show changes there is no progression it's, it's as clear, simple as that. So th this may lead to another question. In your uh, routine screening uh, work for patients for refractive surgery, uh, do you, wh what is the weight you're giving to the epithelial map uh, as opposed to the posterior elevation of, or the anterior elevation? I... I do, I mean, both of them have a different uh, role in your practice, but I believe that the epithelial map is very important. Uh, not all patients come to you with very thinning of your area where there's an elevation, but I do give a lot of importance now to the stromal mapping because ultimately it's a stroma which is going to be telling you whether it is going to be a weaker or a stronger cornea. I'm, I'm not saying that this is going to replace everything, but it's going to add value to your uh, refractive practice in trying to see, to judge and plan what you want to do for your patients. Yeah, very interesting. Okay. Okay, Rohit, thank you so much. That was very uh, impressive. Uh, and uh, now we are going to go to the last uh, presentation which I'm going to present. So I need to share my screen here. Okay, now uh, in, in my talk, it's actually a very uh, short talk and I'm going to, um, uh, to share with you my experience using the MS-39 over the last, uh, I would say, three years or so. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. I started using topographies uh, in the early 90s, actually in the late 80s with the very first uh, TMS uh, topography modulation system that was available at that time. And that was a placido based. Uh, and then we went through the, all the advances of the scanning slit and the uh, Schemflug. The Schemflug was a great um, uh, improvement uh, many years back. But I always had the dream to have a a combination with the, uh, between the OCT, because we know uh, how uh, the OCT is, more, is, is uh, much more accurate than uh, Schemflug imaging. And we learned over the years that the Placido technology, uh, when it became very mature, it, it has no uh, competitor. I, I mean, with, with the Placido imaging, 
you can actually see all the small details, the subtle details on the cornea that you might not see it with the other technology. So when, when um, uh, the CSO came with the, uh, with the combination of placebo and OCT imaging, for me, this was a really a dream that, that came true. Uh, these are my financial disclosures. I'm consulting for CSO, Star Surgical, Physiol, and, and LIDAR. Uh, and being very much involved in refractive surgery over the last 30 years or so, uh, maybe the, the, the main thing I want as a refractive surgeon from uh, an anterior segment imaging device is to exclude those patients who have a, a high risk of ectasia. This includes the moderate and advanced keratoconus, and this is does this do not represent a, um, a, a, a clinical challenge. You can diagnose it easily with any kind of technology uh, available. But more important are those patients with early or very early keratoconus, and, and even more challenging are those patients who uh, we call keratoconus suspect. I know there is no uh, uh, consensus on the definition of keratoconus suspect, but at least for, for the sake of this presentation, let's agree that keratoconus suspects are those patients who have no signs of keratoconus, no topographic signs of keratoconus, but they have a little bit of uh, a deviation from normal. Uh, so we are afraid as surgeons, if we do refractive surgery on these patients, they might develop uh, uh, keratoconus later on. So this is the main thing I want from an anterior segment imaging uh, device. Uh, now, when uh, we look at uh, the, co the cornea of a patient uh, before refractive surgery, someone who is seeking refractive surgery, there are four things that I always look at. Uh, I'm not saying which is more important, but the four uh, components uh, uh, of, the, of the examination are very important. The anterior surface of the cornea, the posterior surface of the cornea, the corneal thickness, and the epithelial thickness. And having these four uh, uh, components together uh, in one uh, map and, and measured with one device is definitely a big uh, advantage. Uh, we can also have other maps from the, from the MS39 uh, like the sagittal map, the Gaussian anterior curvature, which is relatively a new map, and it actually uh, shows the true curvature of the cornea, and I think this map will become more and more important uh, in the future. Anterior elevation, uh, the tangential posterior curvature, which is sometimes overlooked by many surgeons, and I found this map very helpful in many cases to point out to the very early cases of keratoconus. And I always uh, want to look at the uh, keratoscopy image so I can see the, uh, I can assess the validity of the examination. So you need to have at a good coverage of the placido uh, rings in order to, uh, for the map to be uh, reliable. And we also have the uh, keratoconus screening, which actually shows the four uh, things that I just mentioned the anterior surface, the posterior surface, the epithelium, and the corneal thickness, and also the stromal thickness, which, as we heard in the previous present presentation, is the subtraction of the uh, uh, epithelial thickness from the corneal thickness. It gives you the stromal map, which is also important. Having a high, uh, frequent, a high uh, resolution uh, anterior segment OCT also gives you the bigger image of the anterior segment uh, till the anterior surface of the lens. And you can even also reach the posterior capsule of the lens uh, if you focus the, uh, the, the, the device on the uh, little bit more uh, deeper. So um, it gives you a very good image of the uh, anterior segment, including the cornea, the angle, the scleral spur, uh, the iris pattern and the anterior surface of the lens. Uh, and you see the, all the details of the cornea. And as I'll sh I'm going to show you in a few minutes, uh, uh, pre-operative and post-operative, post-laser refractive surgery, 
you can know the uh, depth or the, the, the thickness of the remaining stromal uh, 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 if you're planning an enhancement. Uh, you can see the Bowman's layer, you can see the endothelial and desmet membrane. And with this uh, anamorphic image of the cornea, which is something really new, but very helpful, you can see in details the uh, epithelial, uh, the epithelium, the Bowman's layer, and also the back surface of the cornea. And you can detect any early uh, asymmetry on the back surface of the cornea, like in this case. Uh, now, this is a, a map of a typical keratoconus patients. So if you have a typical keratoconus, what are you going to see? You're going to have uh, anti focal anterior steepening on the anterior map. Uh, you're going to have the same thing on the back surface of the cornea, a posterior elevation, which is very clear. And this is a, a, a moderate or even an advanced cone. Uh, the corneal thickness which will show thinning at the uh, area of the steepening and the posterior elevation. And you will have thinning of the epithelium on the uh, epithelial map. Now, this is a clear keratoconus patient. This does not represent any uh, clinical challenge. Uh, but more important is to look at those cases that where you have a uh, discrepancy between different maps. So in some cases, you have uh, uh, change it on the anterior map, in other cases, change it on the back surface of the cornea or the epithelium. So I'll give you some examples. Some uh, uh, surgeons rely only or at least mainly on the back surface of the cornea. And I would say the, the keratoconus starts uh, posteriorly. And if the post back surface of the cornea is normal, so this is not a keratoconus, but it could be some dryness or irregular. Uh, uh, irregularity of the epithelium and so on. Now, this is a, a patient that I saw recently, and you can see here the back surface is perfectly normal. The uh, corneal thickness is normal. The epithelial thickness is normal. But there is this little bit of uh, asymmetry on the anterior surface of the cornea shown on the tangential uh, map. Uh, this kind of sagging uh, uh, bow tie and uh, again through astigmatism with sagging bow tie. Uh, it can be debatable, and, and some people would say, well, this is not really a keratoconus because the back surface is absolutely normal. Now, I'm, I'm going to show you the other eye of the same patient. This is a clear keratoconus shown on every single map. So uh, this patient had early keratoconus, but it was only detected or first detected on the anterior surface of, of the cornea. Uh, another case, a uh, little bit of irregularity, uh, asymmetry on the anterior surface of the cornea. The back surface is pretty normal, uh, corneal thickness and the epithelium is normal, but the other eye of the same patient showed a clear uh, keratoconus. So again, this is another case where the keratoconus was detected. I'm not saying the keratoconus started uh, on the anterior surface of the cornea, but I'm saying the keratoconus was first detected on the anterior surface of the cornea. Uh, a third case with a central truncated bow tie on the tangential anterior map, and the posterior map shows a little bit of suspicion, but it's very, it's much more clearer on the uh, anterior surface of the cornea. The epithelium and the corneal thickness were pretty normal. The other eye of the same patient showed a very advanced uh, keratoconus, as you see on this map. So from the previous cases, the conclusion is the anterior, the anterior surface detection is very important in early detection of keratoconus. And the best way to, uh, uh, um, to uh, analyze or um, the best way to detect the early changes on the anterior surface is the placido uh, technology. But you have to uh, use the right uh, map and the right steps and the, li the right color scale. Uh, I don't like to use the absolute scale because it masks a lot of information. So I always recommend using the adjustable scale with a middle value of 43 at a half diopter step. This will unmask many of the changes that could be easily uh, overseen if you are using the absolute scale. Now, the posterior surface of the cornea, uh, 
how important it is, it's again very important. And in many cases, the keratoconus is first detected on the back surface of the cornea, like in this case. The epithelial map is absolutely normal, uh, uh, and the back surface of the cornea is clearly suspicious. Uh, and this patient had a keratoconus, but was first detected on the back surface of the cornea. Another case where the epithelium actually uh, doesn't show any changes, but the back surface of the cornea uh, is clearly suspicious and you cannot uh, 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 ignore uh, these changes. Now, uh, so it's not the anterior surface or the posterior surface. It, it's actually the anterior surface and the posterior surface that must be used in order to uh, um, select your cases and to uh, uh, exclude those patients with early changes. Now, we've been using Shamflug for so many years, and that's a very good technology, but that would good, good for the last decade. Uh, if the posterior map with the Shamflug the same as with OCT, actually the answer is not. This case, for example, on the Shamflug is very suspicious. The same eye on the same day on the uh, OCT shows pretty normal uh, posterior elevation. And this patient had LASIK actually more than three years ago, and he's doing very well. Uh, now, the third thing that we look at is the uh, thickness. Uh, and again, having the uh, uh, anterior segment OCT with high resolution, it gives you the accurate thickness, especially in those cases with a little bit of haze or scatter, uh, that you can detect the uh, early changes and more accurately than uh, using the, the chamflu. Uh, the, the most important thing in the, uh, in the thickness map is to look at the thickness deviation pattern, which is very, uh, 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 which is very important to uh, be normal in order to uh, do uh, keratorefractive surgery safely. So that's one thing I always look at. Now, is the corneal thickness measurement with the chamflug the same? as what we are doing with the anterior segment OCT, the answer is a no, it's a big no. And I'm going to share with you this example of a patient of mine who had cross-linking. Uh, this is his uh, corneal thickness using the chamflug before cross-linking, and then three months after the cross-linking. And this is a difference map. So the difference map tells us that the patient had a 35 microns of thinning after cross-linking. You're going to find this uh, in many, or actually most of the publications on cross-thinking showing thinning of the cornea after cross-thinking. And this is, uh, all of them are measured with the chamflu. But if you look at the same uh, uh, information with the OCT, this is the same patient measured on the same day, the same eye by the same technician uh, before and after cross-thinking, three months after cross-thinking, and you can see the difference in thickness is only eight microns. So this tells you that measuring the thickness with uh, chamflug versus OCT is not the same. Uh, now, the epithelium, there are a lot of talks about epithelium in the last few years, and I'm saying the epithelium is very important, uh, but it's not the only important thing. So uh, again, this is the same case I showed you before, a typical keratoconus, and you can see the, clearly the thinning of the epithelium at the apex of the cone. Again, this case does not represent any clinical challenge. It's an obvious keratoconus, and you can diagnose it with any kind of, of, of technology. But there are some cases, like here, for example, this is a patient. Uh, the, anterior, the anterior, uh, map shows kind of symmetrical, regular bow tie. Uh, no much of change on the corneal thickness, except of some thinning. Uh, the posterior elevation is pretty normal, but the only positive thing is the epithelium. Epithelium shows focal thinning here, and uh, this is something that you should not uh, 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 oversee. If you look at the other eye of the same patient, this patient had an obvious keratoconus on the other eye. So in this case, the, the first sign uh, the first topographic sign of keratoconus was focal thinning of the uh, epithelium. But 
Is it the case in, 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 in every case? And as we saw in the previous presentation, actually the answer is no. In some cases that shows a, a clear suspicion, like in this case, it's an early keratoconus, but the epithelial map doesn't show uh, much of a change. Uh, another case with a definite keratoconus shown on the back surface of the cornea, on the thickness map, on the anterior uh, uh, map, but the epithelium shows actually thickening at the area of the uh, steepening. So it's not the anterior surface or the posterior surface or the thickness map or the epithelium. It's actually all of them together. It's not uh, one or the other. It's actually one and the other. Uh, on the CSO, on, on the MS39, there is a set of uh, uh, a very helpful and useful uh, keratoconus screening indices. Uh, I know this comes from the older version of the uh, series and the uh, uh, older version of MS39, and CSO is working uh, dilig diligently on this to improve the uh, keratoconus screening indices, and being part of this team who's working on this, I can tell you that the uh, next or the new uh, uh, release will be, uh, will be much uh, accurate and, and uh, very helpful. But always remember that the, any keratoconus screening uh, index is just a, a red flag. It raises a red flag for you saying, okay, take care. Uh, this might be uh, a case of keratoconus, but at the end of the day, the uh, diagnosis is the clinical diagnosis and the physician is, is in charge of this. Uh, so we have a set of uh, keratoconus uh, indices that are very helpful uh, and that keep improving day after the day. Uh, and uh, uh, that are really, in my practice, I always look at them uh, in uh, uh, selecting my cases for refractive surgery. So now uh, I'm going to, sh to, to, tell, to show you what I'm doing on everyday basis. So on, on a regular practice, in, in, in high volume practice, you, you really want to develop an, an, an algorithm where you can pick uh, uh, all the um, deviation from normal in order not to have cases with uh, 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 post-operative ectasia. So what I do is first thing I look at the anterior surface and here I like to look at the tangential anterior map uh, uh, on the adjustable scale with the 43 uh, middle value and then the Gaussian map uh, then I look at the posterior surface, the tangential map, and the posterior elevation. And then I look at the thickness of the cornea and the epithelial thickness. Then I do the same thing for the other eye. This is a pretty normal eye, actually. And then I look at the keratoconus screening, uh, um, which is very helpful. Here it shows you the anterior surface, tangential, uh, the Gaussian, and then the deviation from normal, the deviation from normality. And the same for the posterior surface. It shows you the uh, tangential posterior uh, sur uh, curvature, the Gaussian posterior curvature, and below here, the uh, deviation from normality. And an important point here is that the, uh, 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 the keratoconus screening uses an aspheric uh, toric uh, surface with a fixed asphericity. So uh, uh, the anterior sphericity used here is, zero, is minus 0 0.25, and the back surface is uh, zero, minus 0 0.3. So this tells you the difference from the normality. And the same thing for the epithelial thickness. It shows you the thickness map of a given patient, and then the deviation from normality. And then the same for the stromal thickness and the corneal thickness. So in one map, you can see all the five important uh, things that you want to look at. And then on your right-hand side, it gives you the different indices. And at the end, it gives you a classification, a suggested classification, whether it's normal or borderline or keratoconus that you take in uh, consideration. And in, the, in this box here, it gives you the uh, high resolution image of the cornea, of the aplanated cornea, and you can uh, see uh, the Bowman's layer, the epithelium, the stroma, in uh, high resolution. Then I look at the same thing of the other eye, of the, of the left eye, the keratoconus screening of the other eye. Uh, uh, and this helps a lot in, make, in, 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 in making a decision whether I'm going to go uh, into refractive, uh, kerato, uh, refractive surgery for this, whether LASIK or PRK or SMILE or anything. Now, another map that I really like, and this is something relatively new, uh, that 
uh, this is the uh, enantiomorphism. Now, we know that both corneas are usually a mirror image. Uh, and you can, if you subtract uh, the right eye from the left eye, uh, it, it, it cannot be done because uh, the nasal in the right eye is temporal in the, in the left eye and vice versa. So what is done here is that you, get, you take the right eye and then the left eye and you swap the left eye and then you subtract it from the right eye. Then it gives you the difference between both eyes. In a normal patient, this difference would be very close to zero because the, both corneas are usually symmetrical. So if you have a patient with an early keratoconus, like in this case, you will have a, diff, a big difference and you'll have asymmetry in the, differ, in the difference map between right and left eye. And because keratoconus is usually a bilateral disease, but usually uh, both eyes are at different stages of the disease, so you can, uh, 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 this map is really helpful when uh, uh, it comes to uh, keratoconus suspect cases. Um, having the uh, uh, high resolution OCT uh, is very helpful in refractive surgery practice uh, in post-operative evaluation of the cases. Like in this case, for example, who uh, was planning to have enhancement, so uh, you want to know the residual stromal thickness and the flap thickness. And this patient had a femtolasic more than 10 years ago. And you can see how nice the interface is seen here. You can measure the flap thickness and the residual corneal thickness so you can decide whether it's safe to go for an enhancement or not. This is the magnification of the same previous uh, map. You see the interface here. You see the uh, Bowman's membrane and you see the epithelium. So you can really see things that you never, that we never saw with the uh, Schoenflug uh, imaging before. The same with the smile cases. And uh, uh, one of the things I discovered uh, since I started using the, uh, uh, um, the anterior segment OCT, that how the uh, interface in the uh, uh, smile, uh, post-smile, gives you some micro irregularity in the Bowman's layer. This is obvious in this case. And you can see this in almost every case of smile. And that's why the smile patients it takes a little bit longer time for rehabilitation compared to the um, uh, femto femtolasic. Uh, if you're doing fecic IOL uh, screening, uh, the the flow devices are, are, are good enough. They give you the corneal diameter, the anterior chamber depth, but with the anterior segment OCT, you can have much more uh, information and, and help you for sizing of a posterior, uh, uh, posterior chamber, um, FECIC IOL and ICL, for example, because it gives you the crystalline lens, the scleral spur to scleral spur uh, uh, diameter, uh, and, the, and the angle of the anterior chamber. And post-operatively, it can uh, help you to measure the vault, to assess the angle, uh, and to see the position of, you, of your lens, whether it's tilted or not tilted. And these things were very difficult to see with a, a Schoenflug device. So in conclusion, uh, I do believe that a combination of the Placido and anterior segment OCT, because these are two very mature and very accurate uh, technologies. So uh, this combination ensures an, the early detection of cases of early keratoconus or keratoconus suspect through accurate analysis of the anterior surface asymmetry with the Placido technology and the posterior surface asymmetry with the OCT. Also, any thickness deviation is easily detectable with the OCT and the epithelial thickness map is also very important uh, to assess these uh, cases. And I really believe that this is the way to go and I'm pretty sure, actually we can see many other companies are following the same path of CSO, and I'm sure in the, in the next few years, we're going to see more and more devices combining the Placido and the OCT technology, and I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alla. It's very good presentation of uh, the cases, especially those keratoconus uh, cases you showed. Uh, I have a question uh, to you. Uh, in your practice, uh, both as refractive and also the corneal surgeon. Uh, have you started uh, giving this more importance than your previous uh, 
propographers. You use this more. Each all refractive surgeons have their one per one one favorite uh, tool, which they finally base their judgment on. So we all have gone through different stages. So do you think that at this point of time, this is your favorite toy where you base your judgment on? Well, actually, the short answer is yes. Uh, yes, since I started using uh, the MS39, I, 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 I think that this is the most valuable tool in my practice. What I'm missing with the MS39 is the, uh, uh, the entire eye aberration. So I'm actually using an aberometer uh, on all my cases. I'm using the MS39 on every cases. I was using uh, a, a, a Shamflug device for the first three years since I had the, M the MS39. And the reason I was using this is I wanted to learn and to compare the uh, uh, imaging images from the Shamflug versus uh, OCT. But now I'm very much convinced that the OCT replaced the Shamflug and I'm not using the Shamflug anymore nowadays. Absolutely agree because more and more every day, I've also started believing that the combination makes it much, much more stronger. And uh, in fact, uh, we are not actually uh, refusing some cases which some patients were actually good for the surgery. See, I can understand that we have to be safe, but we also need to understand that in, in our endeavor to be safe, we should not be refusing something just because the machine says it's abnormal. I think we, we know now whether it's really an abnormality or it's a pseudo abnormality. I think that's Absolutely. something. We... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I remember those days when we started using the, uh, the orb scan many, many, many years back when the orb scan became available even before the, the Pentacam. And then we started to, to rely on the, on the posterior float and we started to refuse many cases. But, and then we realized that was not correct because that was a false positive. So uh, with the OCT, I think we don't have uh, the problem of false positive. Uh, and we can also, we have the ability to, to detect those very early cases and to understand what's happening, to understand why uh, 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 in the anterior surface, as the case you showed in your presentation with the epithelial thickening, but the back surface is normal. So this is a normal case, but, but we understand why uh, uh, there are some changes on certain maps because we have everything in one in one device. Absolutely, uh, Francisco. There's a question for you. Uh, can you? Why is it called MS39? What is the MS means and what is 39 means? It's definitely not an optical word. No, no, no. It's not optical uh, <laughs> related. MS stands for uh, Mura Sergio. Uh, Mura Sergio is the co-founder of a CSO company. And uh, 39 is the uh, uh, um, age of uh, birth. And the reason why is that um, uh, when we release our device, uh, uh, it passes away. And so uh, that's, that's why we decide to dedicate the device to him. So it's uh, uh, mostly an effective reason. So <laughs> it's not definitely optical. Uh, Dr. Alla, I have, a, I have a question for you. Can you please back on, uh, on the case uh, uh, with a... Um, anterior steepening uh, and uh, the fellow eye of the keratoconus. But don't ask difficult question, Francesco. No, 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 no. I want to ask a quick uh, Maybe so, I, I might have an, an explanation, but I want to understand your point of view on this. And I also interested on, uh, on the opinion of Roy and uh, Fabrizio. So I'm going back and just yeah, talk to me. The very when, first case you said, they showed the one with the anterior steepening uh, uh, and uh, and I was a fellow eye of Kratokonos. This is one. This is another one. I think is um, this one. Mm, yeah, let's see. It's not updating yet. So um, my impression was, uh, but uh, I asked for confirmation that uh, this could be a very peripheral uh, ectasia. Okay, and uh, as you can see, also the um, posterior floating rising uh, in the inferior part, uh, but since it's very peripheral, uh, we cannot see a, um, in a way we are used to see keratoconic eyes uh, uh, just because it's very inferior. 
And uh, we also see that there is a, a steepening, uh, a, sorry, a thickening of the epithelium just above. So this could be the hand of the donut, uh, but the minimum is hidden. Do you think this is possible? So this kind of pattern are usually um, um, typical of very peripheral keratoconchi. Do you think that? Well, of course, yeah, yeah, of course, I understand your point and it, it's well taken there. Of course, yes, the answer is it could be, but uh, for, from, from looking at the posterior elevation in this case, I would def I think we agree that this is kind of normal. Uh, if it's a typical peripheral keratoconus, very peripheral keratoconus, it's possible. But then look at the other eye. The keratoconus is not that peripheral. So the other eye of the same patient. So what, I, what I'm saying here is the, is the I, I don't think this is a very peripheral keratoconus, but it's, it's, it's not central. It's not, it's not a central cone, but, the, uh, but it, had be, it was more detected on the anterior surface because it, it's obviously, you know, the pattern, it's like pellucid-like with, um, again, through astigmatism, what we called before the lazy eight. So it's, it's much more obvious on the back on the anterior surface, yes. And your point is absolutely correct. It could be uh, if the uh, uh, posterior elevation can show a little bit larger uh, uh, map, it, we could detect something uh, on the back uh, surface of the cornea. And usually when we have this kind of um, um, thickening of the pillar map in this area, we can expect uh, uh, something just below, at the, below it, yeah. At the, um, pre uh, this is not the first case I, I see like this. So it's not easy to detect something in, in this case uh, without uh, looking at uh, the anterior sure and without looking at the, the fellow eye. But uh, uh, also the posterior doesn't exactly look like a normal, uh, normal. Uh, um, Francisco, yeah. uh, there's a question for you. Uh, do you, perhaps plan to incorporate this device into any excimer laser platform? Would you like to answer this? We love uh, to incorporate these in uh, uh, platform. platform. Uh, mm, we are open to this kind of uh, uh, work. We are already uh, linked with, uh, with some uh, with the Schwinn laser. And uh, um, we are uh, working for this kind of uh, connections. So, um, if you can please, if you can please connect this to all eczema laser platform, that would be good. <laughs> okay, I will uh, work hard to, to make this possible. <laughs> I think that there are some other questions to to answer. So, if you can, um, okay, maybe the first one uh, uh, you already answer. So if uh, you would replace uh, shampoo camera with, uh, uh, with uh, the anterior CT, maybe it's, it's um, been already answered. Um, yeah, the second one is, um, is the one about the platform. Um, yeah, this is, I think, is a, is a request from uh, a colleague from Guatemala. If you can send some stromal segment protocol calculation. I think is a uh, is uh, mostly for uh, Dr. Shetty. I think he's he's asking for a software. Ah, um, okay. A segment uh -huh. protocol calculation. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's see that soon. Uh, this release will be. Yeah. Uh, actually, the software is uh, is already um, using the stromal. Uh, uh, mapping. Uh, if we are looking for uh, the um, path deviation, we have to wait for the official release uh, of uh, um, of uh, 4.0 that only our um, um, key opinion leader are using at the moment. So uh, it's not fully released yet, but it's a matter of days. Yes. What else? You're asking about uh, axial length. Why are we not adding axial length measurement in this? Uh, so that if you add an axial length, then it could be a biometer also. Yes, this would be great. Um, it's not so easy because um, the device is already 
uh, very compact, uh, but uh, these these um, these um, topics is uh, always in our mind, and so we will hard uh, work hard to make it this possible. Uh, I I would also tell to Dr. Alla that uh, sure we can. Uh, uh, we were in discussion about providing you uh, an Osiris, uh, so you can um, um, use uh, all our devices uh, for the full diagnosis of the eye, but we were stopped by the COVID. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully we can uh, arrange this in a few time. And, uh, yeah, sure. This would be great, you know, to have the, full, the, the whole thing. Uh, uh, there is a question here, do we have OCT plus Schoenflug device in the future? Well, you know, I, I had this question before and uh, I don't see a reason to have OCT with combined with Schoenflug because I don't see anything that the Schoenflug is doing that cannot be done with the OCT. So this question is for, 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 for you, Francesco. Yeah. Would there be any advantage in adding Schoenflug to an OCT? No. Uh, okay, let's say that if we add a Schoenflug, uh, um, you know, see the, the price is not going to be the same, so it's not, uh, uh, I don't think that this device is going to have a, a good market. The only real advantage of the only field where Schoenflug has an advantage compared to OCT is the evaluation of opacities. Opacities, and this is also the weak point of the Schoenflug, opacities, uh, are uh, the uh, are better view on uh, on a chef hook system because it's very easy to uh, to see cornea scattering uh, on an OCT and this is also the weak point uh, of the uh, of the chef hook because uh, uh, while we have uh, uh, scattering we have uh, uh, mistakes in uh, edge reconstruction and uh, uh, not reliable measurement so this is the other phase of the coin. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 I actually don't see any, I don't think anyone is going to go into this direction, combining OCT with Schoenflug. Um, and, and yes, as you said, uh, scattering is the, is the big disadvantage of the Schoenflug imaging. Uh, and we, we learned this um, with, with our Schoenflug experience with any patient who had any kind of corneal surgery, whether it's refractive surgery or cross-linking or corneal graft or anything, then the, 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 the system is totally blind. When, when you have scatter, you cannot see beyond it. Yeah. I think that we have a uh, uh, last uh, few seconds for uh, the question for our friend uh, Tamer Gamali. So maybe, uh, maybe you want to answer, Dr. Alam. Uh, would the machine be helpful uh, in understanding the difference between uh, Treating high astigmatism with laser using the toric ablation and cross cylinder technique. So this is most most uh, surgical than technical. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, of course. yeah, yeah, yes, Tamer, yes, absolutely. Um, and the you know we didn't have time to show all the all the features, but uh, if you go on the um, on the differential map, you have the op you have two options: either compare or to subtract one map from the other. And then you can subtract preoperative versus postoperative, and then you can see the difference uh, between uh, the uh, astigmatism, whether different laser platforms. You know, I use this. You know, I have now different laser platforms, so I'm comparing. And uh, yeah, you can compare any uh, techniques if you if you remove if you subtract the pre the the postop from the preop, then you will have a very good. Uh, picture on even the ablation profile of the laser that you're using. Okay. So the last one, how do you compare the accuracy of the BAD in the Pentacam to the Karatukona screening of the Sirius and MS-39? I don't think that we have to answer this question because uh, no one from the other, the competition is uh, replying, so it's not, uh, it's not fair to answer. So it's, uh, let's, so it's up to you, but uh, you can skip the, que the, the question if you like. Well, yeah, but I, I would, I, my answer would be, uh, you know, any uh, keratoconus screening, whether on the Sirius or the MS-39 or the Pentacam or the Galilee or the OPD scan or anything would be just a, a help, you know, a helping, a, hel a helping tool to the surgeon, but none of them 
will ever be 100% accurate. You can never ever rely on keratoconus screening. But what I can say, I can say that with the MS39, the current the available uh, keratoconus screening is very helpful, but I know that it, it will become much more uh, helpful in the future, in the very near future. Okay. Uh, I think that we are running out of time. I would like to thank you uh, all the attendees and uh, all the speakers for uh, uh, being together with us tonight. And uh, uh, this is going to be probably our last meeting before the summer stop. So uh, I will take this chance to, um, to wish you a very nice summer and uh, I hope to see you soon uh, in September. Bye bye. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the panelists, the speakers, and the attendees, and CSO, the RD, and everyone who uh, made this meeting happen. It was really, I personally learned a lot. And uh, have a happy summer and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.